Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being part of our first patent math conference. We hope that you find the next two days serve as a catalyst that helps to support your students, your schools, and your work in general. My name is Jared Campbell, and I have the privilege to serve as a statewide lead for the Patents Mathematics Initiative. And I want to take a moment to thank our math team at Patent. Dennis, Bob, Erica, Lisa, Melissa, Allison, Chuck, Julie, thank you for helping make today happen. This event would not be possible without the extended support of Sonia Barksdale and our entire tech department. And finally, one last team member, Lauren Lutz. She's been our keystone, supporting the many pieces that needed to come together to make this conference happen. Thank you for your extended work with this conference, Lauren. You're appreciated more than I can convey. And thank you to all of you for attending. Without, educate, edu without dedicated educators coming together, there would be no reason to host such events. Lastly, thank you to all of our presenters. We have brought together some of the best in the field to help shape the good work happening in Pennsylvania. And before we start, I want to remind conference attendees that all announcements are on the conference website. This is also where you can access presenter bios as well as session handouts. If you're using the SCAD app, the announcements are located under the info tab. Please note that not all sessions have handouts. To enable closed captioning, click on the CC icon on the toolbar. Without further, further delay, I want to welcome and introduce our keynote speaker today, Dr. Paul Kirshner. Dr. Kirshner, the floor belongs to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jared. Um, uh, what you'll notice is I don't read my slides very much because cognitive load theory tells us that we shouldn't do that. So um, I'll leave it to you to read the slides. People who are watching at this moment, there are 350 people. I'm completely amazed. Um, let's uh, just start. Um, I know it's hard for a lot of people um, I, if I give a lecture in a lecture hall, I make people turn off their uh, electronic devices. I can't do that here, otherwise you couldn't see me. But please try to turn off all of your background distractions at this moment. And um, try your hardest to spend the next 50, 55 minutes just listening to what I say, thinking about what I say. And after this, there's a breakout session or actually a fireside chat in which if you have any questions, you can then ask them to me. We have more than enough time to do that. Um, I talk about learning, but the question is, what is learning? In, in 2006, I wrote an article with John Sweller and uh, Dick Clark, and I, I defined uh, learning as a change in your long-term memory. If your long-term memory isn't changed, you haven't learned. We'll get into that in a second. Learning is something that's very stable. It's permanent, actually. Um, you can forget things, but if you forget them, you can relearn them very, very quickly. Um, you can't learn unless you cognitively process information. That's why I prefer people not to look at all of their distractions. But the problem with learning in any event in an educational setting is that it's not readily visible. On the other hand, what we normally talk about and call learning is actually performance. Uh, performance is not long-term, it's short-term. And you as teachers know that because you work with your, 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 your students. Um, it's Friday, they take their exam. Monday or Tuesday, the next week, um, you continue and you're amazed by the fact that although you taught it and you actually gave them a test on it, which they might have passed, um, they have no idea what you're talking about. You know, like, it's, how could that be? We discussed it last week, you learned it, you got, you know, you took your exam. It's a short term and it's very fragile. If you don't do anything with it, you lose it. You know, it's use it or lose it. Uh, it's something that can be very easily seen, um, an exam result, but it's usually the result of a very superficial processing of information, not a deep processing of information as Craig and Lockhart talk about the difference between shallow and deep processing. I'll give you the time to read this. This slide summarizes what I just tried to tell you. But what I'm talking about is not only learning, but good learning. And the question is, what is that? 
Now, I always use a, um, yeah, could so call it a holy trinity, saying that uh, good learning is effective, efficient, and enjoyable. And what do I mean by that? Well, if it's effective, you achieve what you want to achieve. If you uh, want to make it better, make it more effective, you want to have them achieve that or learn better or more or deeper. Efficient, people usually think I'm talking about how much time it takes. That's also the case, but it's not only the time it takes, it's also that it costs you as a teacher and it costs your students as learners no unnecessary effort. They do the things that are primarily necessary to learn and learn well, and all of the other things, the seductive details, the, the playing or whatever, which doesn't add to learning, they don't need to do. And finally, enjoyable. People often see that as being fun. That's far from what I mean. Um, it, it's nice if learning is fun, but it doesn't need to be. Enjoyable for me is that you get this feeling of, of, of success and achievement that at the end of the day, you have the idea, you know more or you could do more than you could at the beginning of the day. And all of these things are also for the teacher, that the teacher has this feeling of effectivity, of, of effectiveness, of efficiency, and also this feeling of success at the end of the day. I've reached my students better. They've learned better. That, as we say in Dutch, you go home uh, whistling and in, with a smile on your face. And... What you often see in these types of, of presentations is that people tell you what you should do. I won't be telling you what you should do. I don't know what you should do. I can tell you what you can do. And I can help you understand why you can make use of it, why it might work, why it won't work. But it's important for you to understand the whys and the hows much more than the what. It's not a checklist. You do this, your students will learn well. It's, it's meant to help you become a better reflective practitioner, to reflect upon what you wanted to do, what you did, how it went, and that you can then make it better the next time. I often compare it to being a doctor. A doctor has a knowledge of anatomy, physiology, pathology, biology, all of these different types of things. And because she or he knows that, she is capable of not only saying, well, you have this, I'm going to prescribe that, but can think of different things that might work better in different situations, play into who the person is and understand that we're talking about a virus, not a, a, a um, oh, what's the word in English, bacteria, and as such, penicillin won't help. So it's, it's understanding the whys and the, and, and the hows much more than the what. Uh, John Sweller, my colleague and friend, I just was conversing with him today in Australia, wrote this, said this, and I will repeat this just to place emphasis on it after you've now read it. Without an understanding of human cognitive architecture, instruction is blind. You're just doing things blindly, following checklists, but not doing things because you know, or you have the feeling, or there's a reason why it should work and how it should work and by whom it should work and by whom it might not work and in what situations it might not work. Sometimes it's more important to know what won't work or what couldn't or shouldn't work than to know what does work. I'm now gonna go into these three aspects of science. I, I could fill a whole course with what I'm trying to do a bird's eye view in 50, 55 minutes, I could fill a whole course with it. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about these things. And the first thing is information processing. What is information processing? That's you store information on the one hand and you retrieve it. It goes in and out. It goes from your working memory to your long-term memory and then back again. And if you don't process it, if you're busy checking your mail at this moment, you're not processing the information, you can't multitask, so there's no storage or retrieval. If you just 
um, read, reread, reread. You're doing very little processing. You're not really thinking about what you're doing. And it's very fragile. It's temporary. It might help for um, achievement, but not for learning. If you do a lot of processing, the storage becomes stronger and the retrieval is longer. You forget it less quickly. And finally, if you do a lot of processing and also different types of processing, think of it like a, uh, a marathon runner who, don't own, who doesn't only run marathons days in, day in, day out, but does interval training, runs up hills, runs down hills, goes to the maximum, takes uh, time to, to recuperate, all of those types of things. She or he is doing a lot of different things in a lot of different ways, and that leads to better being a better runner. The same is here with learning. I try to put this in other ways. This is for those, it is a math conference. I think you all should understand this and maybe remember it even better if you think of learning and retention in this way. I'm now going to a, into a little bit about information processing. Before 1960, people like Thorndike and Watson and Skinner and lots more had this black box behaviorism. There's nothing wrong, by the way, with behaviorism. Uh, for learning uh, the, the, the addition tables, the multiplication tables, it's great. It's really, really great. But um, they had this black box. They didn't know what was going on in the head. You gave a stimulus uh, to the students. The students gave a response. And there was a consequence, a pat on the head, uh, 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 a knock upside your head, whatever. In any event, that's the way people thought about learning. They didn't know what happened here. In 1956, uh, Broadbent, Donald Broadbent, was the first person who said, hey, it's about attention. And he said, well, this comes a get a lot of sen input, input, and it goes into your sensory store. He called it the sensory store. And then he talked about a selective filter. And he said, based upon properties, the pitch of a sound, the loudness of a sound, at that point in time, you select certain things you to attend to. And what you don't attend to, that is lost. And what you attended to goes to what he called higher level processing, and then to the working memory. That was 56. In 1968, Atkinson and Schifrin brought it a step further. And they said, okay, you have this input, these stimuli, and they go into your sensory memory. And if you do nothing about it, you'll forget it. And it's possibly the case, I don't know where you are, but you might hear your computer humming if you now stop listening to me, or hear the sounds outside, or your children if you're doing this at home, whatever, that really doesn't matter. But those types of things, you've kind of not selected to listen to it, so you forget it, you've lost it. Now, I was rather stupid, I said, all of these sounds around you, so you're selecting that and possibly not listening to me, so forget about all of those background noises come back to me. If you select it, it goes into your short-term memory, and short-term memory is very short. It's three to 20 seconds, and it's also very small. Um, uh, George Miller said seven plus minus two. Uh, Cowan, Neil Cowan, talked about uh, uh, four or five. In any event, it's not very many things, new things, that your short-term memory can deal with at a certain time. If you rehearse it, if I tell you my telephone number, you'll um, and rehearse it, you say it a number of times, the chances are strong that maybe you'll remember it for a short period of time. If you don't do that, if I just give you my telephone number and you don't do anything with it, you'll probably forget it very, very quickly. But if you do something with it, if you rehearse it, if you organize it in a way, for example, my cell phone number begins with 06 followed by 30, and you put in your head, oh, 0630, that's five times six is 30, because there are 10 numbers, 10 pairs of two numbers, 0630. All of a sudden, you've organized it and integrated it in your long-term memory. You no longer remember 0630, but you remember 630. And then it's fewer chunks. And 
the more often you make use of it, that you take it out of your long-term memory and you use it in what you're doing. For example, when you're at a party and you're introduced to someone, and you say, well, this is Paul. And you look at my face and you say, oh, Paul, uh, this. And, and Paul, I heard about this and this. And hey, Paul, have you ever done that and that? By repeating my name, looking at me, making connections, you're remembering, you're recalling my name, you're repeating it a number of times, and you'll probably remember it for a longer period of time. In 1974, Badley and Hitch took that exact same thing, but took it one step further. Number one, they changed short-term memory to working memory. That's where the processing happens. And they said this working memory is bigger than just one amorphous mass of anywhere between four and seven, eight um, uh, pieces of information. Part of it is, is visual spatial, has to deal with what you see and also what you see in your mind's eye. And Adele is phonological. And that's what you hear, but also what you hear when you read aloud to yourself in your own head. And they said, this makes it bigger. And because of that, these things can interact with each other and even make the memory trace stronger. To look at it in a different way, you can see it this way. But I said this, there are quite a number of sensory inputs that come in, and you can only deal with four or five or six at the same time. And we call that sensory band bandwidth. And if you look at this, you can see that about 12 million bits of information come into your sensory store at any one time. Uh, 10 million from what your eyes see is because of all of the neural connections uh, in your eyes and to your brain. But your bandwidth is very, very small that you can deal with. And when it comes to working memory, we have a problem. You have all of this coming into your sensory memory. And you have a long-term memory that's virtually unlimited. So that's no problem. But we have a working memory that's very, very, very small. And we have to, as teachers, deal with this bottleneck. And this isn't something new. Um, we know it from um, John uh, uh, Anderson when he was talking about schema theory. Um, we know it uh, from Anderson, uh, um, uh, was it uh, Badley and Hitch? And John Sweller had to think of a way to deal with this or wanted to think, and he came up with this idea of cognitive load. Now, cognitive load is something that's really, really simple, but people make it very, very difficult. So what I'm going to try to do in the next couple of minutes is to explain it to you in a way that I hope you'll understand it and also remember it. And think about this um, in the um, fireside chat afterwards. If you have any questions, you can come back to this and ask me about it there. Unfortunately, we don't have the time here. Um, cognitive load is this. Um, I, I could have put other words, um, uh, the amount of money you need to buy something and the amount of money you have. And if you look at this and you're all mathematicians, so if you look at this, you can see everything's okay as long as the numerator is smaller than the denominator. But if the numerator is bigger than the denominator, if something costs more money than that you have, if something requires more mental effort than that you have available, you come into a problem. And what, what, what are the sources of this, this effort? One, well, they have two. Some people talk about three, John Sweller, Slava Kalyuga, I, and now after us, quite a number of other people have finally seen the light. And there are two sources. You have one source of effort that's inherent to the task. That's something that you can't change. I'll go into that very, very shortly. So just remember, intrinsic is inherent to the task. And in extraneous is things that you add to the task that go above and beyond the task itself. And these two things together are the mental effort required for carrying out the task. And another thing that's often forgotten or mixed up is that people think um, that, the, I, that, the, that the goal of cognitive uh, load theory is to minimize the effort, minimize the load. But that's not the case. The idea is to 
optimize it. Okay, and I'm now going to give you a an analogy where we're going into um, not mental effort but physical effort. That it, it, it's, it's very similar. Let's take the amount of physical effort it takes to climb the stairs. Um, if you have to climb every day 15 steps to the sixth floor, you have to climb 90 steps. That's inherent. That's intrinsic to the task. I can't change that. I can say take an elevator, but it's a six floor walk up. So you can't do that. So that's inherent to the task. I can't change that. What's also inherent to the task is how large the steps are, how much gravity you have to overcome with each step. If your steps are like the steps on the left-hand side, that means that the task will be, you'll have to take more steps, but you have to overcome with each step less gravity. And that means you'll expend little, a uh, 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 smaller amount of effort climbing the stairs on the left than you would on the right, okay? And in the way the chosen approach, yeah, you can look at that by, if I ask you to do three steps at a time, or do it more quickly, or do it with a backpack on with weight in it, that will all add a certain amount of load to the task. So all of those pictures, putting that into one simple slide looks like this. And now, what's the case with learning? With learning, it's the exact same thing. You have an amount of load inherent to the task. That's how complex the task is. 3x is 6 is less complex than uh, a, a, a polynomial or, um, yeah, I forget the words in English. Uh, y is mx plus b. Um, yeah, that type of, of, of task. Um, that's less complex because there are fewer elements and there are fewer interactions between those elements. You can think of it also in terms of learning a foreign language. If you try to learn Dutch, um, you can learn words. Um, uh, uh, this word in English is this word in Dutch. Talking, let's say, about nouns. But if you try to speak the language, the uh, genus, the genus, the, 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 if it's uh, 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 the gender of the noun tells you what article you should use with the noun. You only have an English the, but we have de and het in Dutch. And it also means the adjective changes if it's male or female or neutral. But it's also dependent upon the level of the learner. A child seeing why uh, uh, 3x is 6 has all of this new things like, okay, what is now a variable? And what does that mean? And how do I do this and carry it out? That if, if that person has a low amount of prior knowledge, the task is fairly complex for her or him. But a person who, let's say, has already taken algebra and has gone on to geometry or trigonometry, um, will find that type of task very, very easy and other things will be different. So depending upon your level of prior knowledge, prior experiences, the skills that you have, the intrinsic load becomes less. And the extraneous is what pedagogy, in Dutch we say didactics, what pedagogy do you use for this? Because some things add less load than other things. Um, discovery learning adds quite a lot of extra load because you have to see where you are. You have to use a means ends analysis. Uh, where am I? Uh, what do I have to do to reach my goal state? If I do this, does it bring me closer? Uh, yes, no, no, I have to go back. Yes, okay, I did this. Oh yeah, what was it? What have I learned here? How do we do it? Whereas if you make use of worked examples, worked out examples, things like that, it has much less cognitive load. 
But what's important to know is sometimes adding load can be good. That's what we're talking about, about optimization. It's not a question of choosing a pedagogy that has the lowest amount of added load. Sometimes it's choosing one that adds load, but adds load in a way that you learn better. And in the sports, in sports, going back to an analogy, we talk about no pain, no gain. The photo on the left is what speed skaters do to um, train their legs so that they can go through, if you do the 10 kilometer, uh, which, and it's a, something is, you have to go through 50 curves on an Olympic oval, which means 50 times you have to be in that situation of the guy on the left. And you do this, which makes it harder to do, but it trains your legs. So if you're a basketball player, you put leg weights on while you're in training so that your legs go stronger, so that in the game, you can take, when they're not on that, you can jump higher and run faster. And you can think of a trainer will have you do three steps at a time or go up, stair, up, the, up the steps much more quickly or using a stair climber, put on extra weight so that you train your muscles in your legs so that when you need it, they're stronger. And it's the same for learning. Sometimes adding load is good. And um, Robert Bjork, and along with him later, his wife, Elizabeth Bjork, came up with the concept of desirable difficulties. Desirable difficulties are here. Just like in running, it requires you to expend more mental effort, but the extra e mental effort that you expend is positive. It helps you to learn. It helps your long-term performance. It's not extra effort that leads to no learning or little learning. Robert Bjork calls it making it difficult, but in a good way. And uh, he spoke about these desirable difficulties. Some of you might have heard of it, but if you haven't read his original works, sorry, I need a glass of water. If you haven't read his original articles, then you're missing two. I'm gonna go through them now. Okay. Interleaving, contextual interference, space practice, reduced feedback, and tests for learning. Strangely enough, the things you normally hear about are one, three, and five. I don't know why they chose uh, the odd numbers. I could say the prime numbers, but two is also a prime number, so that doesn't work. But in any event, you normally hear about one, three, and five, and often don't hear about two and four. I'm going to briefly talk about all five of them. Remember, these are making it harder. These make learning either harder or appear to be harder, but in a good way. The first is interleaving. What is interleaving? Uh, what we normally um, see, especially in mathematics, is you learn, but also in, 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 in language learning, in, in, in art history or whatever. You learn a specific technique or thing. You learn how to um, uh, determine the uh, circumference of a circle or the area of a circle. And you practice and practice and practice and practice it. And then we go over, how do you do it with an oval? Or how do we do it with a triangle? And you practice and practice and practice and practice it until you have that. And then you go over to topic C and continue. That's the normal way of doing it. Interleaving says mix and match them. Mix A and B and C and B and A and C and B and A in any order that you 
one. So that every time you ask someone to practice it, they have to think of what formula um, should I be using here? Why should I be using it? Um, is this the right formula or is that the right formula? Hey, this looks like that, but it's actually different. And that means I have to do it differently. So you have you look at things that look the same on the surface, but are different deep down, or things that look different at the surface level, but are actually the same deep down. And you can do it in different ways. You can teach topic A or topic B or topic C in a lesson, and not only topic A, and tomorrow continue with that. So it doesn't cost you more time. In three different days, doing ABC, ABC of CBA in the third lesson, BAC, costs the same amount of time as doing lesson one with A, lesson two with B, and lesson three with C. Or when you're studying, you can study it in, in different orders during your study session. Constantly discriminating between it. And you can say, well, does this make a difference and why? The reason, the thing is, it does make a difference. As you can see here, um, and this is uh, from Patton and Bjork in 2022, so it's fairly recent. You look at it and you say, well, in the training, that which is blocked, when you did it, you A, 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 B, 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 B. And at the end of A, you test someone. At the end of B, you test them. They seem to do better if they block their study. But when it comes down to the delayed test at the end, those in the blocked learning situation learn much more poorly than those who did it in the interleaved way. But students have a completely different idea of this. They think that the mass practice leads to better learning, whereas in the final test, the spaced practice or the interleaving work better. And here is the reason why. This is what I talked about. It works because it helps you to discriminate differences between similar things. And it involves remembering similarities between things that look different. And in that way, you learn to discriminate and transfer it to all different types of situations. And there are goods and bad ways of doing that. For example, some people think that interleaving is uh, first we do math, then we do Spanish, then we do history. No, it's about something in math. And it's not about anything in math. It's things that are related to each other. So you can say, well, we do uh, 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 perimeter and we do um, area and then we do volume because those are related to each other. And it's not that we do uh, perimeter and then we go over to uh, algebra and then we go over to geometry within mathematics, okay? It's also not too many topics you should use, not too much time in between them. Those are the things you should do. The second, which we almost never hear about is contextual interference. Uh, that comes originally from work with things like tennis and things like that is that you can either within the skill vary or between the skills vary. So uh, serving and returning and in different situations within a um, learning situation, if you're in art history, it could be uh, with a minimally within and minimally between is just recognize different Quantalist painters based upon their specific styles and recognize different styles in a random order as finally in the top right hand going to a museum where all of the different painters with all of the different styles in many different rooms and recognize them in a completely different setting than in the classroom. The third one is uh, space practice. This is the way most people, I could say students, practice and study, but that's not the best way to do it. We know since 1885 with Hermann Ebbinghaus, he called it the um, forgetting curve. He said, well, at your initial try, if you learn it, you learn it to 100%. And within the shortest period of time, you forget 20 to 40% of what you've learned. 
That's the red line in the graph. And if after a day, you again, try to relearn it and bring it up to 100%, you also forget it and forget fairly quickly, but you forget fewer things and it's slower. The curve becomes less, what's the word in English? Less, I don't know the word, you all know it and you're probably yelling it to me in the background, um, but the slope of the curve is flatter. And you'll constantly forget, but it takes, you forget less and you forget more quickly. And the way we research that is we let people either mass or space practice a certain thing and you practice, 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 and then you give a test or you practice, wait a day or two, practice, wait a day or two or three and practice again, and then you give a test. And what you see is this. If you spread it, The, large, the spacing between the study sessions and the test, you see that more is learned, more is returned. And that has to do with this. By doing this, you're constantly organizing and integrating information that you're dealing with in your working memory into your long-term memory. And that strengthens the um, storage strength, and I should have had another slide here afterwards in which the bottom arrow under organize and integrate or above remember and recall, recall was also blue. And because what you're doing here is by constantly retrieving it from your long-term memory, you're increasing the retrieval strength. So by doing this, both doing things by both interleaving and spacing the practice, you're increasing the storage strength, and you're increasing the retrieval strength. Now, here's another look at the forgetting curve. Um, and this is actual research. The fourth is reduced feedback. Um, you, I, everyone as a teacher thinks that the most important thing to do is give your kids feedback, lots of feedback, feedback that gets them to think and things like that. But according to Robert Bjork, what you need to do is reduce your feedback during the learning situation. Uh, David Didow did it over a course, he says at the beginning of a course, you give quite a lot, and as you're going through the course, you delay it, you reduce it, you summarize it, you make it um, less specific. And at the end of the course, you hope that the feedback has been internalized, because if you're constantly giving specific, detailed, and immediate feedback, what you're doing throughout the course, you will teach your students not to think, because they know they'll be getting the feedback and what happens, they get the feedback on the paper that they've, they, they, they've done or the test, they put it in their bag and they don't look at it because you as a teacher also are constantly giving all of that feedback and also not asking your students to do anything with it. But that's a completely other webinar on uh, testing and feedback. And finally, the last one is retrieval practice. And there are all different ways of doing that, you can call it practice testing, but you can do it with a placemat and you can do it with exit tickets and you can do it with flashcards and you can do it with what's called Cornell notes that you see on the right in which you take your notes in one section in the large section uh, on, on, on the right of the right hand illustration um, where you then put the keywords in the margin and you summarize it on the bottom. And in that way, you do it in a way that you have to make use of your notes. The next day, think about them and write your keywords down. And a day or two later, write the summary of it. And all of those things lead to what you can see here and the bottom. By retrieving it, you're specifically strengthening 
the retrieval strength. A second thing that we can do to make the load a little bit higher, but in a good way, are what are called generative learning strategies. Now, there are two groups of people. Uh, Gavin Brov had a, uh, wrote a really good article about generative learning, but Logan Fiorello and Rich Mayer wrote an article and a book about it, about generative learning strategies and what are they, what they are. Um, it's their strategies that make you do something beyond what you've been given. Take that information, think of it as, as clay, as you're given a lump of play, a clay. And the idea is that you don't just leave it there and look at it and carry it around, but you 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 work with it in a way that you change what it is. You knead it into need it k-n-e-a-d you need it into something new so it's not about just being engaged with what you're doing because you can be engaged with things in which you don't learn anything from it but you're constantly taking what you've been given you organize it or reorganize it in a new way you then integrate it into your prior knowledge Another definition of that is here. So it's not, you don't take it at face value. Oh yeah, this is the, uh, uh, the, 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 the law of uh, Boyle Gay-Lussac, but you do something with it. You, for example, draw, um, uh, a situation in which you have some warmth and a balloon and the volume increasing or whatever, in which you try to change the words that you've read into something else. And what you're doing when you do that is you're selecting information, organizing it, and integrating it. By the way, if you notice, I never say to you, remember that slide from uh, about information processing, where it's necessary, I bring it back to you. That's called temporal contiguity. And I choose to make certain words more prominent to help you to form a better picture of what's going on. So here you see again, select, organizing, and integrating, just like you saw here selecting, reorganizing, and integrating. And uh, Rich Mayer and Logan Fiorello wrote it down in this way. Again, that's the same as this, but presenting it in a different way. That's also a technique that you can use with your students, presenting the same information with a number of different, in a number of different ways, which will help them to retain it more. And you have to even also ask them to even relate one to the other uh, image from what does it mean? And what I did was I made a visual representation of the contents, drawing. Logan Fiorella and Mayer, they distinguish eight uh, generative learning strategies, they're all here, where you try to paraphrase phrase and, and put the main points into your own words, or you map it, you change the written or the spoken text into a spatial representation, knowledge maps, things like that. Um, where you draw it, what I did um, in, in the previous slides, imagine it, so you don't even have to draw it in your mind's eye, make a mental image of that. Have them self-test themselves, retrieval learning. Have them try to explain it to themselves or teach them as a study strategy to constantly not just take it at face value, but explain why does this happen uh, when uh, you heat up something that it expands. 
Brownian motion, things like that. They have to think about it. Have them teach it to another one. It doesn't even have to be a real person. If you tell them they have to teach it to another, but don't let them teach it, they still learn better than if they've not taught another or if they do teach another. And to enact, to make task relevant movements. We see with um, children learning the letters of the alphabet that acting them out, and I'm not going to go sing YMCA to you, but those types of task relevant movements uh, led learners to, young learners to better recognize and be able to write the letters of the alphabet. And now I'm going to go into my final series of slides. And I will get it done within the time limit. And that's explicit instruction. Because what I've been talking about this whole time is actually explicitly instructing your students. I've never told you or said anything about letting them discover it on their own or inquiry or just let them play or things like that. I'm talking about different techniques for explicitly instruction, instructing and how that works. And we know that from Barrick Rosenshine, he wrote um, first uh, principles of instruction for the UNESCO that had 17 different principles of instruction and for, um, principle, for um, the American Federation of Teachers, the, uh, uh, what is it, which was it? Teacher educator. He um, changed that into 10. It's a beautiful, if you just look up principles of education, uh, principles of instruction, AFT, you find a great article by him on this. He talked about things that work. He looked at it from um, teacher effectivity studies, cognitive psychology, but also um, uh, how um, uh, cognitive skills can be best taught and achieved. And we first have to eliminate a straw man, and that's that this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about explicit instruction. I'm not talking about giving a lecture. And no one, when they're talking about explicit instruction, is talking about giving a lecture. A lecture is just one pedagogical technique, which is sometimes very handy. What I'm talking about is what I did with my granddaughter, my granddaughter Elsa. This is when she was two and a half, three years old. I would take her to the daycare on the front of the bicycle. They live in Utrecht. I live in the South. So we'd come there for two or three days. And I loved bringing her to the daycare. And I brought her on the front of the bicycle. And when you are in the Netherlands, a city like Utrecht, this is what it looks like. Um, at 8, 8.30 in the morning, you have a traffic jam of bicycles in which you sometimes have to go wait for two or three traffic lights. And we're sitting there, the two of us, she on the front of the bicycle and was sitting there and she says to me, Grandpa, why are we stopped? And I said, hey, Elsa, look at that light there. What do you see? It's red. I said, well, when a light's red, that means you have to stop. Why, Grandpa? Now, the reason is very simple, Elsa. If it's red for us, look on the side there. It's green for the people coming from the left or the right. Elsa, do you know what left and right is? She says, yeah. Left is when I hold up my hand and I see the letter L, and right is where I throw the ball with. I said, very good, Elsa. Now, if you look at there, it's green for them. So that means they can go back and forth. And if we go through a red light, we could get hit by a car. Yeah, but grandpa, that lady next to us, she just went through, she just, she just bicycled through the red light. I said, Elsa, it's a very, very bad lady. Very bad lady. Why? I said, well, it's bad because if she goes through the light, she could get hit by a car. She says, Elsa says, yeah, but that's her own fault. I said, yeah, but if the guy in the car or the woman in the car tries to avoid her, that means they can hit another car or come into a la hit a lamppost or even veer off to where we're standing and hit us. So you shouldn't do that. Okay. I could go on like this for hours, but I won't. At a certain point in time, we're a year or so further. And at this type of a crossing, and I say to Femke, of course, I'm holding up my hand. And I say to, say, to, say to Elsa, Elsa, can we go to the other side? She said, no, Grandpa. I said, why? 
said, because the light's red there and we that means we can't go. Why not, Elsa? Because if it's red for us, that means cars can come and we can get hit. Very good, Elsa. And now, yeah, it's green. Let's go. I said, no, Elsa, give me your hand. No. Why can't we go, Grandpa? Well, first we have to look left, then we have to look right, and then we have to look left again. Hey, huh? why, Grandpa? The light's green. I said, Elsa, you remember that 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 bad lady who 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 rode her bicycle through the red light? Yeah. Now we could be here, and there could be a very bad man or woman driving a car coming from the left or the, from the left hand side. Which one was left again, Elsa? That one? Yeah, right. Okay. Could come. And if that's a bad man or a bad lady, we have a green light, but if they drive through, we could get hit by the car. Oh, yeah. Now that's, yeah. I, I can understand that, Grandpa. But why do we have to look right? Said, because on the other side of the street, the cars could be coming from the right. And you have to see if there's a bad man or a bad lady or if they're all very, very good and they stop for the light there. Okay. Okay, okay, Grandpa, left, right, I understand that. Why do we have to look left again? I said, well, Elsa, what do you think? I don't know, Grandpa. I said, well, we have to look left again because we have a green light, but the bicyclists and the cars on the street on the side of us, they also have a green light and they can make a turn. So right before we step off of the sidewalk, we have to make sure that nobody coming from the street on the side of us is making a turn and that can hit us. Okay, Elsa, we're ready. Can we go again? No, Grandpa, you spent so much time talking. The light's red again. And now, Elsa? Yeah, we can. Okay, what do we do, Elsa? And she takes the, she goes, we look left and then we look right and then we look left. Can we go? Yeah, we can go. Give me your hand. We go to the other side. And we do this a number of times. I no longer prompt her. She goes by herself. And by the end of the day, she can do it all by herself. She's a big girl. And when we get home, we have kind of like a debriefing with her mother, Femke. And I say, Elsa, what do we do today? And she said, I learned how to cross the street. And tell Mama what you learned. Well, first we have to look at the light and then we lift the whole thing. So she regurgitates as it is. After we've done it a number of times, she makes it explicit again. And the last time I went to Utrecht last summer, I've gotten there more, but last summer, I went with her to school and she was bicycling and she led the way. And what did I do? This is Barrack Rosenschein. This is explicit instruction. We began with a review. What does it mean, a red light? Those types of things. Everything was in small steps. I was constantly asking her questions. I modeled the behavior, look left, look right, all of those types of things. I guided her practice. I checked constantly if she understood what I was talking about. I wanted to get a high success rate before I let her do it alone, because I only, at that point in time, had one granddaughter, and I didn't want to lose her. And I wanted her to be able to get to the other side of the street 100% of the time, and not just 50 or 60 or 70% of the time. If we came to a crossing in which there were, in, instead of a, an X, there were five different ways, or there was no traffic light or whatever, I then stopped, and we went back, and I scaffolded this new, more difficult task. And at a certain point of time, I said to her, Elsa, you go ahead and you tell me now what we're supposed to do. That was the independent practice. And when we got home, I sat down with her and her mother, having something to drink, some cookies, some tea. And we reviewed what she did. She verbalized it to her mother. We carried out a very interactive, direct instruction. And I, I, I dare, any person who says that children, especially young children, can and should only learn by play, you let your child or grandchild learn to cross the road playfully, discovering it, but I'll do explicit instruction. And let's see at the end of the day who has fewer um, uh, accidents 
and more grandchildren. But what we see when somebody like Greg Ashman asks about it and what people learned at teacher training, almost 45% said that their teacher trainers portrayed explicit teaching as bad. Now we're done. In order to be a top teacher, you need to understand in your own domain, that's mathematics here, know how we learn, know this and how we learn, know the tools that you can use to do that, and also the pedagogy, because top teachers are important. High achieving children with a poor teacher three years in a row still learn very well, but low achieving children don't. Whereas give those high achievers good teachers, the low achievers also learn quite a bit more. That way you close the gap. I will not show this because I know we have to be done. I'll show this possibly in the uh, um, uh, breakout session. This takes two minutes. Um, you can break in if you want to. Jared, do I have two minutes to show this? Please open your mic. Uh, no, not at this time. We're going to have okay. to. Okay. You want to know more about urban myths or what works, you can do it. You can follow my blogs or you get in touch with me. It's 12 minutes after three here. That's exactly the amount of time I was allowed to have. Jared, the floor is back to you. 